We are half an hour away from the opening bell in Hong Kong, in Shenzhen, and in Shanghai. Welcome. You're watching The China Show. I'm David Inglis with Yvonne Our top stories this morning. Stock investors playing it safe here in Asia while Treasury yields fall from 2024 highs ahead of that all-important U.S. CPI print. New Zealand's central bank is set to hold its key rate next hour. You have upside risks to inflation. You have sluggish growth. You have an economy that's in recession also and also slumping business confidence. Plus, President Biden said to host leaders of Japan and the Philippines in Washington, aiming to send a message to China as tensions rise. All right, as you can see, it's pretty quiet. <laughs> it's pretty flat. We're talking Asia, U.S. futures, and the liberal dollar index. And there really is only one game in town in the next 12 hours or so. And it really is that U.S. CPI print as well. So we're basically sort of treading water here right now. But it had a decent session in the U.S. despite some of these nerves around that U.S. CPI print as well. So stocks as well as bonds did actually rally. We're seeing that stabilized here in the U.S. and the Asia session. But we're still trading around that 435 level for U.S. 10-year yields. Uh, also, bond markets here are still catching a slight bit here this morning that Aussie 10 year yield is down some seven basis points. Keep in mind, as we talked about, it's not just the, the U.S. CPI print, it's the RBNZ as well, given the fact that they went into a technical recession. Is there more of a preference? to lean towards a cut now from the RBNZ. That certainly is one to watch. And will we see more pushback from the central bank? Uh, you know, we're seeing a little bit more elevation when it comes to iron ore prices and dying in particular. We're still up about 1.7 percent. So the last two days have been very strong buying into ore as well. Equities in Tokyo, though, for example, are slightly on the back foot. Singapore is also closed here today. Uh, and we're watching very closely what goes on uh, with, of course, treasuries here this morning. You flip the boards. Golden Dragon Index, though, did see a pretty decent day. So uh, watch this NetEase story. We saw the stock in Hong Kong pop yesterday on speculation about this strategic partnership uh, with Microsoft. So that certainly is something that could really drive the tech gauge here today. But the Golden Dragon Index was up one one and a half percent or more. And futures are looking like this here this morning. You take a look at just the amount of, you know, money piled into bonds uh, in the CGB market, that one-year yield is, is now sub-170. So that brings us back to those 2022 lows here this morning, 723.74 for your dollar China. Not a whole lot of movement, but you got to wonder what's going to happen. We talked about treasuries, right? The amount of short interest being piled into treasuries leading up to this U.S. CPI print just goes to show how bearish this market is right now, Dave. Yeah, and what's interesting, too, about the timing is that you have the CPI well, the CPI report coming out, and then after, a few hours after that, I think you have a 10-year bond auction uh, as well. So I guess one would determine the outcome largely of, uh, of the latter. Uh, simply, well, I mean, since we mentioned bond auctions as well, we, we have several today as far as Chinese bonds are concerned. So you have a rally that Yvonne talked about, this drop in yields, plus 2026 and 2031 bonds are set to be auctioned out today. Massive move up in iron ore, iron ore prices, so we're tracking that and obviously the equity derivative uh, of that specific trade. Hang Seng Index, 17,000. We've been testing that. We briefly touched uh, and surpassed that level. Uh, we have yet to see a sustainable close uh, above that level recently, so that's one to watch. Esprit shares, of course, on the back of the strategic partnership uh, that the company uh, uh, basically put out this morning a few hours back. All that being said, of course, net ease is a story to track. We're now looking at 163 a pop in the early going, so we are indicated higher from yesterday's close. That's about 1.5%. I'm doing some rough math there. Uh, very, very quickly, US CPI, the expectations are a pickup in headline, a drop in core from the prior month, a drop month on month, perhaps more importantly is what we're expecting there as well, based on some of these estimates. And our guys at Bloomberg Economics thinks that this report will back the Fed's faith in this ongoing disinflation narrative. So we'll see how that comes out. Pricing on your Fed fund futures right now, it's effectively a coin toss in June. It's a full rate cut is priced for July as we speak. Yep. So I think, you know, we can increasingly see the market abandoning those the three cuts, uh, you know, for this year from the Fed. Mm -hmm. Let, let's see what Chilo says from BNP Paribas, Asset Management, Senior APEC Market Strategist. He joins us now. Chilo, it's interesting. Uh, the last two inflation prints out of the U.S. came out hot. 
if we see another print that's hot this time around, is this going to be more than just an aberration now and more of a trend? Well, it could well be, but uh, I think from the Fed's perspective, uh, as Chair Powell was saying uh, recently, that he still believes that the uh, uh, January, February inflation print uh, was sort of a short-term noise thing. Now, when you look at the fundamentals, uh, if we get CPI numbers come out higher than expected, as long as it's not too high, I think the market will have certainly see uh, short-term correction, but then... Once when the dust is settled, when you look at the fundamentals, which is basically what I'm talking about here, is productivity growth. Uh, that has always uh, also been rising. The rate cut picture uh, in the medium term, i.e., you know, in the second half of this year, is still pretty much intact because the economy is going to slow down after 15 months of uh, uh, policy tightening and so on. But the point here is that with productivity rising in the U.S., uh, it sort of offs offset a lot of the inflationary pressures, which should make a rate cut case still uh, uh, intact going forward. OK, well, th the follow up there would be how many rate cuts do you think are we in for uh, for this current cycle, <clears throat> you know, with possibility of a higher neutral rate? You mentioned productivity, this shift up in bond yields. Where do you how low do you think we get this cycle? Well, I guess uh, it all depends on the relative dynamics between inflation growth and productivity growth. Now, at this point, uh, the market is looking at three cuts, maybe even two. Uh, I intend to think that we could still get uh, three cuts uh, starting you know, in the fourth quarter or late third quarter uh, this year. Uh, now, if we do get inflation come down further, uh, in the coming months, uh, you know, we could get three cuts earlier and probably we get back to four cuts. You know, at this point, I think the market is quite uncertain about um, the, the, the dynamics between the inflation and productivity, which is shifts depending on the data release. And like the Fed, I mean, we are all data dependent and we just have to uh, go by the data releases. Uh, and it's uh, all this confusion, you say, has, has really kind of shifted this whole Treasury curve higher. Mm. Do you think we've seen the highs in terms of Treasury yields for the year already? Uh, I intend to think so, but I can't really uh, rule out short term, near term uh, spike uh, further in the uh, Treasury yields. But I guess at four and a half this level, uh, if the rate cut story is still intact, as I described just now, uh, it could be a good level uh, to, you know, get into treasuries and this could be the peak. What, what's interesting as well is how well stocks have done, at Chilo, globally, uh, perhaps with the exception of China, which, you know, that we can talk about that later. That specific group has lost momentum recently. Why do you think equity markets have done really, really well uh, in, the, well, in the absence of rate cuts at this point? Well, I think it's, it's mainly, mainly the, the, the expectation of no recession sort of like a, a soft landing scenario or as somebody termed it, a disinflationary growth scenario going forward. Now, that's good for stocks because there's not going to be any rate hikes. Uh, inflation will be steady towards you know, the 2% uh, target of the uh, uh, central banks. And growth is still there. That we, even though we may be looking at slowing growth, um, you know, the, the rate cuts eventually that comes into the market will boost growth further into next year. Now, this is, it is this expectation that is now driving the equity markets, which makes people uh, still more uh, willing to uh, get into the, the risk trade and, and, and bet on the stock market rather than on the bond market. What's also been doing well this year in terms of what asset class is, is commodities, um, mm. up Chilo, whether it's oil, whether it's gold. Is this something that you think is just mainly driven by geopolitics or, or something more fundamental going on? Uh, gold is mostly to, uh, driven by geopolitics. And then there's also fundamentals because demand for, grow, uh, for gold is rising. In China and in India, retail demand is quite high. Central bank demand for gold is also rising, especially from uh, uh, China. Uh, the uh, energy market, I think, again, it goes back to the expectation that there is no recession. Uh, and when you look at the global um, manufacturing uh, cycle, it, act it, it actually turned up since about two months ago, uh, which means that you know, the expectation is that going forward, we are likely to see a recovery in global manufacturing, which in turn uh, will increase demand for energy and commodities. So right now, I think the market is sort of like in an expectation of a sweet spot 
that we don't have recession, we don't have rate hikes, and inflation is coming down steadily and so on, and that you know buoys uh, stocks and uh, and commodities. We're in a good place, as, as they say. Chilo, we stay with us. We want to pick your brain on China and really what type of exposure is, is appropriate at this point in time. Uh, market strategist at Asia Pacific, of course, at BNP Paribas Asset Management, G rejoining us in a, in a couple of minutes. Now, still ahead here, this AI frenzy has been igniting, has been igniting this ETF boom in, in Taiwan. Check this out on your screens. And some investors even taking up reverse mortgages. What? <laughs> what are you doing to buy into this? The details of that just ahead, counting down to the open of trade. 20 minutes away, opening bell in Hong Kong, in Shanghai, and in Shenzhen. Futures are pointing higher this Wednesday morning. This is The China Show. Good morning. All right, so we are coming off four days of weakness onshore markets. I think three or four days of relative strength in the Chinese currency. Bond auctions today, 2026, 20, 2031 bonds. Uh, on deck today. We're also net ease. The initial pricing will come out in seven minutes' time. Let's talk China right now with Chi Lo, BNP Paribas Asset Management, senior APAC market strategist, still joins us right now. Chi Lo, our, we had a guest yesterday from Amundi, CIO, says it would be a big mistake not to get exposure to China at this point in time, although they did acknowledge as well that 90% of their clients don't even want to hear about China at this point in time. They're still in this I don't know, this phase where, you know, give me anything but that. Why do you think that premium, that risk premium in China still remains uh, across global equity markets? Well, first of all, the market is not convinced that the Chinese authorities are now going full force into more aggressive easing to bail out the economy. Hmm. Uh, they have, the market has been disappointed for too long. But more importantly, I think this negative sentiment has sunk into uh, the investors' mind for too long that, that in my view, uh, makes the market too, way too bearish on Chinese growth and hence Chinese asset market uh, recovery. The example is that when you look at energy consumption growth, there is data series showing that in China. Energy consumption growth has been rising faster than the official GDP growth rate since the fourth quarter of last year. Now, this indicator, energy consumption growth, is supposed to be more accurate, reflecting the underlying economic activity. And the market used to take it as a, a, an argument when the, this indicator was growing less than GDP growth uh, rate uh, as an evidence that you know, China was lying, you know, growth was worse than expected, and so on. But now, when this indicator is now growing faster than GDP growth rate, why hasn't the market talked about it? I mean, this is, to me, this is strange. And then when you look at other indicators like, you know, mm. tourism, personal, uh, passenger traffic growth and so on, there's life in the, in, in the economy there. So my point here is that we need to see the Chinese authorities to continue the aggressive policy easing, which they started only, you know, two, two and a half months ago to sort of underscore the momentum uh, for growth going forward. When we get that in the next few months, there's a very reasonable chance, high chance, that the Chinese growth will come back, Chinese asset markets will recover. Uh, but then at this point, I don't think the market is pricing that in, which in a sense, I think there's mispricing in the market. So, so you think despite you know, the structural issues we're seeing in the property market, which we haven't seen any turnaround in the data there yet, it seems, Chilo, maybe you could prove me wrong, um, or even you know, inflation still remains quite low, you know, asset prices can still recover despite those structural issues. Uh, you're quite right, uh, Yvonne. The, the property market is quite key here. And, and that goes back to my point about, uh, you know, the need for Beijing to continue the aggressive easing because the, the aggressive easing measures, the big job of that is to stabilize the property market. Now, without property market stabilization, confidence won't stabilize, confidence won't come back. And what I talked about, the eventual recovery won't materialize. So we need to see policy to help stabilize the property market. And it seems to me that there are some green shoots in the property market that it's trying to stabilize. And, and we do need more data to show that the, the market, that the property market uh, is stabilizing. If we get that, say, three months in, a, uh, in three months' time, 
then it is you know it's likely that we do get uh, uh, confidence uh, stabilized, consumption uh, growth faster, and then the economy momentum will will pick up. Well, what do you think we've yet to see from policymakers that they have indicated they're ready to do? Well, when you look at uh, monetary uh, indicators like the net injection by the PPOC into the system through all these lending facilities, it's been rising quite sharply since late last year. Uh, Beijing right. is picking up on those liquidity injection by issuing more bonds and, and you know use that funding into uh, new infrastructure spending and, and so on. So the, the public sector is more active now mm. and, and, and proactive, actually, and try to bring things up so that the private sector can right. follow later on. Uh, there's a lot of talk about whether this economy needs some sort of Western-style QE. And, and then certainly, uh, Ch Chilo, see if I want to get your take on this, because mm -hmm. it seems like some economists we talked to say that's just displaced. You know, these comments that we heard from Xi in an, in an old speech uh, doesn't really indicate that they're even considering it right now, and, and it just doesn't fit with the financial goals of China in mm -hmm. some ways. But do you think China needs this sort of stimulus like QE? Nope. Not, not in China. I think China doesn't need uh, QE. The reason why central banks do QE is because interest rate has hit this zero limit. And in China, where is interest rate? It's still way high below, uh, uh, above um, uh, zero. So there's a lot more way for monetary easing through you know, credit pricing, easing, and so on, before they need to do QE. And secondly, you know, when central banks do QE, their system are uh, in dire state that needs liquidity to boil things up. But in China, I mean, the, the loss of confidence we all talked about, to me, it, it, it is a cyclical uh, issue, which aggressive easing can turn around. It is not a permanent uh, 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 problem uh, there in China. Asset bubble burst in China, yes, it, it did burst, the asset bubble in property market and, and so on. But the extent of the property bubble, uh, property bubble burst in China as compared to, for example, Japan back in the early 19, uh, 1990s was way smaller, which means that the wealth destruction and confidence destruction in China is way less than what Japan went through. So without this permanent big hit or shocks in the Chinese system, I don't think the authorities need to implement any, any QE, and I don't think QE is on the agenda. Okay, uh, let me sharpen that. Chilo, I know you wrote about this China versus Japan uh, uh, comparison. Is, is, is China now comparable to Japan before the bubble burst, in other words, high debt levels, or after the bubble burst, no inflation, low rates? Which, which, which version of Japan? Uh, there's some, some similarities, but there are more differences, uh, as I explained. But to cut the long story short, I don't think China is sleepwalking into a Japanese uh, economic problems uh, because, as I said, the bubble burst, the wealth destruction, the confident destruction uh, are not as big as uh, in Japan. And most importantly, Japan committed a policy mistake of having too long a conservative, even contractionary policy, especially monetary policy. Uh, when you look at China, monetary, money growth is still at double digit or close to double digit. Without monetary contraction, you will never get deflation in any system, not just in China. So these are the big differences that we, you know, we have to be mindful about when we compare China with Japan. I still uh, am of the view that if the Chinese authorities can come in with more assertive uh, uh, easing with conviction, the system can be turned around uh, and, and, you know, the, the, the outlook will not be as dire as uh, Japan uh, back in the 1990s. Chilo, thank you, senior market strategist for APAC at BMP Paribas Asset Management. Uh, that renminbi fix just crossing in the last few seconds or so. Uh, it's pretty much steady as she goes, uh, 709.59. So still seeing some support from the PBOC, of course, as that onshore rate still under a bit of pressure. We're still hovering near the lowest level since November for the onshore rate. You're seeing a little bit of movement, a bit of whipsaw in the offshore rate here this morning, 724.14. Uh, but certainly uh, not much of a story here. We continue to see that's fixed in line with what we saw yesterday, too. Yeah, there's a big event later today. I think the eclipse is happening. <laughs> that's, that, that's past. <laughs> is that okay? Okay, maybe it's inflation. <laughs> um, uh, net ease, there we go. Just very quickly, pre market's out, half of 1%. Maybe the bulk of the reaction was yesterday. Confirmation 30 minutes back. Uh, the company renewing its deal here to distribute Blizzard games in China, NetEase and Microsoft to enter a strategic 
partnership. There we go. The Open, eight minutes away, you're watching The China Show. Here's some big corporate stories that we're following here this morning. Intel will roll out a new version of its AI chip in the third quarter in a bid to compete with NVIDIA. The Gaudi 3 processor focuses on helping to train AI systems and running the finished software. The CEO, Pat Gelsinger, says that the chip will cost less than NVIDIA's current and future processors. Boeing shares fell in the lowest in five months after the New York Times reported that the Federal Aviation Administration is investigating compl complaints about safety issues. They say a Boeing employee who worked on the firm's 787 Dreamliner aircraft alleged that sections of its fuselage were improperly fastened together. Meanwhile, the plane maker handed over 83 jets for the first quarter, logging its lowest deliveries for the period since mid-2021. The majority of the planes were 737 MAX jets. Meta is downplaying the threat of AI disinformation in a big election year at an event on Tuesday. Its top leaders say they haven't seen that happen yet on their services. Last week, Meta announced plans to label all AI-generated content on Facebook and its other properties. Experts fear such media could mislead voters or spread disinformation online. We're looking at an update in the early goings, five minutes of the opening bell. In fact, 1% following the 1% gains in the HS Tech Index yesterday. Day, led by EVs in the early minutes. Xpeng up 5%, Neo up 5%. So we'll watch those names as we get into the opening bell. Now that's a story in Hong Kong. The story in mainland China has been different. We're looking at four days of either losses or just generally uh, weakness. Uh, that market has fairly been lethargic of late. Uh, in, in the CGB space, it's busy because in the short end, the things are continuing to fall. And we're looking at the one-year yield getting closer now to the 2022 low, below which we're back to 2020 levels. Analyst Actions, Ag Bank, uh, I think we have Bocom and also Lens Tech uh, in focus that he rated new by Guosun Securities, Changjiang. Uh, Bocom Asia is rated, reinstated by uh, at Changjiang and of course SWS Research. Ag Bank Asia is rated new buy as far as that is concerned. A couple of stocks to watch too. Yeah, we are watching very closely net ease in that stock. You know, it, we already saw a bit of a pop there yesterday on speculation. Some local reports talking about this a partnership uh, with Microsoft. So they have confirmed it this morning that they will enter into that strategic partnership. Uh, and now we're around, I think, the, the stock 8% higher than before that pack broke back in January 2023. We're also watching us for the EV sector as well, some March retail passenger vehicles sales yep. pretty strong for the month as well. The Open is next. This is Bloomberg. All right, you're watching the China show. We're coming down the open of markets, Hong Kong, Shanghai, and uh, when it comes to Shenzhen. And you're seeing Hong Kong in the pre-market at least still catching a decent bid here this morning. Futures, though, are still flat. We're, we're seeing no movement really in the FX markets, of course, as we count down to this U.S. CPI print. We're still tracking everything from EVs, from net ease. It's even though CGB yields are continue to edge lower, Dave. Yeah, on the one year, the two year all the way, I think, to the 30 year CGB yield. We're now at multi-year lows. In fact, we were talking about 2002 lows in, uh, on the long end as well. So the short end is really what's been picking up. Yvonne was talking about this confirmation, NetEase and Microsoft, so uh, Activision Blizzard there. Uh, and of course, as it pertains to some of these EVs, for example, data yesterday out of the Passenger Car Association, we'll get to the reaction in just a moment. Uh, favorable, whether that's year and year uh, or even month and month. Uh, the open is looking like this, 1% higher on the back of the 1% gain that we had on the HS Tech Index yesterday. And a lot of that in the early goings, we just had a look, has to do with this move up we're seeing in EVs. Big move yesterday in Hong Kong, big move up overnight, X Pung Neo, so those same names uh, we're tracking here. We talked about a 10-year yield. We have a 2026 and 2031 bond auction today um, out of China as well. Weakness coming through, so this is day five if this closes below that sort of zero level as we speak here. So day five of weakness in CSI 300. Hang Seng, though, is going the opposite way. Uh, flip the boards, please. We talked about this one-year yield just to show you how close we are. That's where we are. That's what we need to take out. It takes us all the way back to pandemic lows. We're very close to that, just below 1.7% at the moment. Okay, as promised, Hang Seng Bank, buyback. 
announced this morning. Bottom of the screens comes out with that. Uh, the, the aggregate amounts, 3 billion Hong Kong dollars, up 5% in the early goings. Thank you so much. Uh, Xpong is up 5%. We talked about this. And check out, we were having this debate whether or not we would need to go big on Esprit today. <laughs> I think the stock price is telling us exactly what that decision, it turned out to be correct. 34% strategic partnership. Uh, MOU, this is mostly in Europe, we believe. Company came out with a statement today, and AgBank, of course, getting an upgrade. Yvonne was talking about this earlier on. NetEase and other gaming stocks, very, very quickly here. Initial reaction 4% move yesterday. Not a lot as we checked it earlier on, 5 tenths of 1%. Uh, but as you can see, of course, some of the other sort of related names are seeing some upside today. Might have to do with the fact that stocks, generally speaking, are doing quite well today. Did very well yesterday as well. Yvonne. Yeah, they are doing quite well. Um, in fact, Han Seng Bank, as you mentioned, on the news of that buyback program, is actually the number one gainer when it comes to the Han Seng Index here this morning. Uh, New World's on the other side as well as laggers. But as you mentioned, it's really the EV sector tech that seems to be what's driving this rally here. So certainly that's a lot on tap here this morning. Let's bring in our Bloomberg Asia equities reporter, Charlotte Yang, to tell us you know, what her team, and in particular, you guys are watching this morning. Yeah, I think um, the gaming space is one because of the latest report about NetEase resuming this um, partnership with Blizzard. The shares of NetEase itself has gained a lot yes yesterday, so we're not saying that much today. But with you know, the, yesterday they also approved this new batch of gaming, which could be showing that you know the regulatory environment is getting better for this gaming stock. So we're watching actions there, and also with the EV space, as you mentioned, yeah. Xpo, you know, they have been the more volatile um, shares because I actually just checked their short interest level uh, of the ADRs. Neo is now surging over 90 percent. Wow. So. So, you know, the March sales for the EV sector is pretty strong, but um, the first week it sells for in April, according to uh, Citigroup, is actually not looking that good. So, yeah, we'll watch to see if, if the moves um, hold on there. This, uh, just on a broader market, let's keep it on that. JP Morgan out with some advice on how to bet on this Chinese rally. Yeah, so the JP Morgan strategist have just came out saying that they suggest investors to buy cheap options on the larger cap indexes, you know, um, just to capture any potential rebound in the Chinese stock market. As we're saying, you know, things are improving on the broader market level. And also with the economy, you know, the PMI in March was, um, the official data was the highest in the year. And also you have um, strong exports as well as, um, in, as, well as rising um, uh, consumer prices. Prices. So the specific trading strategy they're giving is to buy uh, a like narrow call spread on FTSE um, China A50 or like Hong Kong shares, or just buy China call um, China equities call call, contra call contracts. Mm. And also to show you know how sentiment is improving. Um, if you look at the Hansen um, China Ent Enterprise Index, the volatility skew is actually has been falling, which suggests that there's um, you know less demand for buying protections against steep declines. Charlotte, thank you so much. We'll check back with the China Markets team, of course, our Asia Stocks team later on. Charlotte Yang, our Asia Equities uh, reporter. Right, um, let's talk about EVs um, and really this massive move up. And literally some people are actually betting the house on this. Uh, surging interest in AI stocks has triggered this uh, just almost crazy $50 billion <laughs> ETF boom uh, in Taiwan. Rebecca Sin, our Bloomberg Intelligence ETF analyst, joins us this morning. She's in Shanghai for us. Uh, today, well, it's easy to see why it's become so popular, uh, Rebecca. What are you seeing from an ETF perspective here? So from an ETF perspective, this was the largest ETF launch ever globally. And so record numbers. So Yuenda launched a Taiwan value high dividend ETF just last week, and they amassed $5.5 billion in assets under management on the first day. And so it's a record number. Um, prior to that, BlackRock held the record with roughly $1.8 billion. And so this is significantly more than what anyone expected. And to give you an idea, if we look at all of the top 10 ETF launches globally. In Asia Pacific, five out of 10 of those ETFs came from Asia, specifically from China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong markets. And so we expect that this ETF can get as much as $8 billion by the end of the month. And so it's a huge amount, lots of interest coming out from investors um, and record ETF launch globally. Yeah, I mean, we were just talking to our colleagues in Taipei about you know, there's influencers that are talking about it on YouTube and, and, and what to buy in these ETFs. You have people taking reverse mortgages even just to buy an ETF. I mean, what are regulators saying about this frenzy here right now? 
So I think it's really interesting that uh, there's such high demand. What was most surprising of this launch was that most of the assets came from retail investors. Traditionally, when you have a large ETF launch like this, most of the initial seed money comes from institutional investors. But in Taiwan, it was mainly all retail investors. And I think the reason why there's such a frenzy around this is ultimately this ETF provides first monthly dividend. It's very rare to get monthly payments. And so a lot of these people that are buying these ETFs are Gen X people born between 1965 to 1980. And ultimately, these people are in the retirement phase and they're looking for stable income, which this ETF provides. I think the other thing is the yield on this is pretty good. Last year in 2023, this ETF had an 8.6% yield. And I think thirdly, um, it's a multi-factor product. And historically, uh, ETFs were single factor. So for instance, only dividend paying or momentum or value. But this ETF combines both dividend and value. And so there's a lot of uh, interest in this. And I think specifically with the Taiwan market, Taiwan's market is very tech intensive, very AI focused, so you know, semiconductors. And a lot of these companies have done very well recently. So if we look at the Taiwan index, uh, more than 70% of the constituents are tech related. And so the yield on these companies are quite good. And I think with the peak dividend season coming out in Taiwan, which is usually over summertime, uh, this provides a good opportunity for investors to get in at the right time. So this ETF has exceeded everyone's record and expectation. Um, there's a huge frenzy around retail investors. You know, to your point, some people were mortgaging their house, um, putting all their investments into this. So uh, it will be very interesting to see what happens with this launch um, as it goes. And we could see more products coming similar to this. Yeah, but personally, that, that's my sign to get out when <laughs> someone, someone does a reverse mortgage on, on something else. You know, one to watch, of course, some of these influencers. But that, that's a personal opinion. Uh, Rebecca, on a more serious note, what's the cost of this ETF? Do people distinguish between costs now? Or are they just going gangbusters on this? I think for Asian investors, cost um, Asian investors are not as cost sensitive. Uh, we have this theory that we okay. say crazy rich Asians, and in the U.S. they're a little bit more cost sensitive. Everyone looks at management fees. So if we look at the Bitcoin ETF, everyone, uh, a lot of the ETF issuers went to zero management fee. In Asia, you have the opposite effect. If it's cheap, people get scared. People are like, oh, there might be something wrong with it. So actually, in Asia, people tend to pay more, and they feel that higher fees may uh, lead to a premium product. And so in terms of this ETF. ETF, you know, it's priced about ballpark, um, not too expensive, but I think that there is a lot of demand for this coming in to this product, and so we could see more ETF launches with a uh, dividend in it. Traditionally in Taiwan, anything with the word dividend has done phenomenally well. Uh, last year there was another dividend ETF that launched that gathered $1.8 billion on the initial day, and so I think that the cost um, is fairly accurate and fairly priced, and so I think that there, we could see more demand coming from this ETF. Rebecca, thank you. Rebecca in there, our Bloomberg Intelligence ETF analyst. As, as the Uanta chairman says in this story, everyone just needs to take some rest. If you're, if you're yeah. sick, you go to the doctor, you get some medicine. Yeah. But eventually, everyone's going to have to rest uh, in some ways there as well. So uh, thank you so much, Rebecca, joining us from Shanghai there. Coming up next, we look at the trilateral summit in Washington between the U.S., Japan, and the Philippines and what message it's sending to China. We have plenty more coming up. This is Bloomberg. China's whole strategy is to isolate the Philippines, isolate Australia with their economic coercion, isolate Japan by not accepting uh, their fish to be exported. Our strategy is to flip that script and make the, the isolated party China. They're the ones that are uh, isolated in the South China Sea as it relates to the Philippines. They're the ones that are isolated when it comes to trying to uh, use economic coercion to coerce Australia to change their posture. And they become the isolated party, which is why they throw in the towel on that effort. The U.S. Ambassador to Japan, Rahm Emanuel, there speaking to us as Prime Minister Fumio Kishida prepares to meet with President Biden at the White House. And the South China Sea is expected to be top of the agenda when Kishida and Biden hold security talks on Thursday with Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. So Biden and Kishida said to meet on Wednesday today as well before that. But let's get a bit more analysis on what this all means. Joseph Gregory Mahoney is with us from Shanghai. He's a professor of politics and international relations at East China Normal University. Uh, 
Yeah, first and foremost, Professor, thanks very much for joining us. How important and significant is this meeting in your eyes? And how do you think Beijing is going to respond to it? Well, you know, I think, we, of course, we had to put it in the context of the recent uh, Yellen visit, which was trying to promote some sort of uh, positive image uh, uh, with respect to bilateral ties. But, you know, there's always this, you know, one step forward, two or three steps backwards uh, that we see from the U.S. whenever there's this sort of uh, positive outreach to China. And uh, I think, you know, clearly um, what we're seeing here with uh, the meetings with Philippines and Japan um, is this uh, effort to uh, really uh, establish uh, uh, once and for all, certainly with uh, the Marcos uh, uh, presidency, uh, which has uh, been much more amenable to Washington than his, than his predecessors, um, to, to establish once and for all this uh, U.S. Uh, strategy, uh, which, which appears to be dr uh, driven by uh, the, the need to sustain um, uh, um, uh, military uh, uh, capacities in uh, uh, on China's borders, including the South China Sea. And one of the things that we're, that we're not really told about uh, from the U.S. side is the extent to which its militarization of the South China Sea, including, uh, including uh, incredibly dangerous and destabilizing actions by nuclear submarines, some of which we've learned about through accidents, have led China uh, to take a stronger position there uh, above water. And of course, the irony here is that you know before we started seeing these meetings uh, that, that are that are coming now, um, you know the, the, the longstanding history had had, had been uh, that uh, no, no other uh, that that, that uh, in, in terms of the Philippines history, uh, the U.S. and uh, Japan had had probably brought the most harm to that country over the last century or so. Yeah. Uh, and so now we're having this this positive meeting about a threat that is is not really real. Could you be more specific? What, what threat do you consider not really real? Well, you know, I, I think when we look at a lot of strategic analysis, one of the things that led uh, China into the South China Sea to, to take uh, a stronger position there was not the desire to harvest more fish or to take oil uh, uh, in contested waters from Vietnam. Uh, and, and on this point, I think Emmanuel's wrong. I think uh, China's relationships with Vietnam have improved uh, over the last few years, and that relationship's being well managed. Uh, but, but to counteract um, uh, what the U.S. has constructed underwater, which is, according to a number of experts, uh, an underwater uh, sonar wall uh, enacted by a submarine strategy that aims to uh, be able to impose a naval blockade at a moment's notice uh, should Washington want one. And China has been struggling. This is a part of its struggle related to the Dalyu, but also in the South China Sea, to push back against uh, these restrictions uh, as a matter of, uh, of self-defense, but the U.S. has characterized this as China taking an aggressive position uh, against its neighbors and drawn uh, the Philippines and Japan into this narrative as uh, strategic partners. Uh, understood. So let's, let's I guess, take, take a step back because we're literally in between two fairly significant events, Yellen in Beijing uh, in China, and of course we're going into this trial lap between the, the three countries that we just talked about there. The, the former largely positive for relations. The latter, I can't seem to think of a scenario where that would uh, put Beijing under a, a, under a favorable light. Net, net next week, do you think, Joseph, how do you think this relationship, are we better or worse off between China and the U.S.? Well, you know, I think Gellin made the point that uh, relations now are better than they were a year ago without acknowledging that they were l uh, worse last year due to false assertions uh, regarding an errant weather balloon, assertions that were later uh, conceded were false by the, the Pentagon. Um, but, you know, again, I, I think that um, uh, 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 Yellen, I, I don't see her visit as a positive. I think she came here selling a lie, uh, a lie that uh, Bloomberg itself has suggested is, is false with, with regard to overcapacity. Um, and I think she came to, to uh, foreshadow more uh, protectionism and tariffs. And keep in mind, she was doing the same thing in Africa last year, uh, promoting the, the, the disproven uh, story about uh, BRI promoting uh, 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 debt traps. So I think she's become this very effective uh, grandmotherly figure uh, that has uh, attracted some positive um, attention in China, some Chinese admirers, giving her 
her um, attention to Chinese female colleagues, her appreciation for Chinese cuisine, mm. um, and her genial demeanor when meeting with Chinese officials. But I think her real purpose was to come here and to sow fear, uh, particularly as we uh, are expecting some positive first quarter reporting uh, uh, with uh, the, the Chinese economy, uh, with the understanding that mm. uh, consumer and investor confidence still isn't where it needs to be. And, and I mean, as, you, as you say, she has the charm. Um, she brings the charm. And, and what is her role, do you think, now when it comes to diplomatic relations with China? Is she more the leading face, more so than, than Anthony Blinken now? I think so. I think Blinken uh, has spoiled his image. Uh, you know, they're, they're, we've had so many memes of, of Blinken in China uh, where, where he comes and says something positive and then, and then you know, 10 minutes later or a day later, uh, his message is being undercut uh, uh, by Biden directly. Um, and uh, Blinken himself has, has you know, uh, been someone who's promoted a lot of anti-China discourses, including the, the, the spy balloon nonsense. So I think that uh, he has, um, he's taken more the role of being the lead in, in, in promoting positive relations with countries like Japan, the Philippines, and trying to advance the anti-China narrative in Europe, whereas um, uh, uh, Yellen um, uh, has taken the lead um, here in, um, in China. And uh, Joseph, to build on your earlier point there, then do you think Beijing sees through this veneer, this overcapacity mm -hmm. narrative veneer? Absolutely. You know, Beijing uh, uh, knows as well as Bloomberg knows that this is not a real issue. Uh, Beijing said that, uh, you know, the U.S. should examine this uh, issue uh, objectively and, and with an eye to understanding uh, the market. Uh, we all know why the United States isn't competitive in EVs. We know that their legacy automobile industry suppressed the development of that industry for decades. Um, and we know that China has been very open um, and competitive in EVs, uh, especially almost a textbook case uh, uh, with regard to how they welcomed uh, 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 Tesla and others and forced the Chinese EV industry to compete. And that's one of the reasons why it has emerged in the forefront of, of uh, uh, the, the, that, that market worldwide. But, you know, the other point here is that, you know, the, Be Beijing is very much aware that this is an election year and that there's a lot of pandering, right? Uh, and that uh, uh, Be uh, Biden uh, needs uh, Michigan. Uh, he's, he's fighting a tough battle. Uh, he needs Michigan. Uh, there are a lot of auto workers there who are afraid of uh, uh, competing with uh, China because they don't have good EV products. And he's pandering to those votes. So, you know, China understands this. Every year that we have an election year with the United States, um, uh, we see uh, China being targeted. So I think China's trying to maintain a positive narrative, trying to still keep to this uh, this positive image that they that they took out of the, the APEC meeting between Xi and Biden late last year, uh, but also trying to avoid getting into a negative discussion, realizing that uh, the real goal here, I think, is to uh, try to convince uh, Europe to come along and to uh, keep moving forward with uh, Chinese EVs, where Chinese EVs do have a foothold. And of course, uh, the tremendous uh, success that EVs, Chinese EVs have had in Australia. So the, the, the real battle here is not right. about the U.S. market. It's about these other markets that the U.S. is also trying to influence. Well, it's certainly one way to look at it, to your point, China's doing well with EVs. The U.S. is trying very well, I guess, in some ways to do uh, with chips, for example, right? So um, Apple oranges or maybe the same fruit basket there. Uh, Joseph, thank you so much. Joseph Gregory Mahoney, East China Normal University. Thank you so much, Professor, for your time. Let's talk again soon. Plenty more ahead. You're watching The China Show. Uh, now for check of markets, one stock in particular is leading these gains here. Hang Seng Bank a few hours back announced its $3 billion Hong Kong dollar buyback plan. We're up 5% on that. Uh, biggest shareholder, of course, HSBC. City analysts coming out and saying we view this as a positive surprise demonstrating management's commitment to return. Excess moolah. They didn't use those words. <laughs> Surplus Imagine capital <laughs> to shareholders, but they could have used it. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we make finance fun. Yeah. Excess moolah. All right. Take a look at your benchmarks here this morning. Of course, we've been talking about this rally when it comes to the tech space here. But Hang Seng Bank clearly is one of those outperformers. Hang Seng is now up. Uh, get this. 17,060, Dave. Wow. We talked about that 17,000 psychological level. We're way above that now, it seems like. And HS Tech seems to be helping that. We're supercharged by 2%. Uh, 
in the tech space. It's the EV sector that's really driving that as well, pardon the pun. Iron ore also doing quite well in Dahlia. We're up close to 2%. And we're continuing to watch, of course, what goes on with the CGBs. They're stabilizing now, but you watch at the short end, that one-year yield is now back to the lowest levels we've seen in two years. All right, later on, yeah, there's a big one coming up. If you want to stay up with me, I'll be speaking with KKR's <laughs> Kate Richardson. 6 p.m. 6 p.m. is late for me. I'm that it is old late now, for us. Yeah, yeah. and we work very early. Yes. Kate Richardson from KKR, also Daisy Ho from HSBC Asset Management, is uh, going to be joining me at the special event here in the city. It's Bloomberg's New Voices, an initiative focused on developing senior women in finance and business. Bloomberg subscribers can watch the launch on Live Go from 6 p.m. Hong Kong time. We'll bring you highlights of those conversations later on. On. Bloomberg Television. Do you have a sense of what the 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 the, the, cr the crux of the private credit? That's all they want to talk about. Okay. Client interests a lot in China, uh, not so much in China, but maybe more so Japan and India. Mm. That's really one thing they're watching very closely. But it's all about product development around the private credit space now. So it's all everyone wants to talk about. Yes. Of late. There we go. Okay. Stay tuned for that at those times on your Bloomberg. Uh, I think we ran a function there. I think it's Live Go. Also, if you want to uh, keep Yvonne. Company coming up in the next hour. <laughs> Please do. Uh, Mark Conan, CIO, AIA Group joins us to talk things, all things macro. He thinks we should be adding more risk to your portfolios. RBNZ decision also coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Right, welcome back. Uh, we're counting down to this rate decision out of the RBNZ. Will it be a great decision is the question there. They've kept rates unchanged. Um, certainly inflationary pressures do look slightly elevated. That's a question mark. The economy, as far as growth is concerned, we're in a recession there. So how do the, those confluence of factors come in and really, I guess in some ways, carve out what the tone and in the statement looks like. Are there going to be any any change, material change from the last one? So that rate decision will be out in about 10 seconds or so. Yeah, and, and are they going to push back on, on these expectations that they are maybe leaning towards these cuts, right? That mm. certainly is sort of the narrative that we're seeing among many central banks. Now, particularly when it comes to the if FOMC seems to be not in a rush to cut as well. There you go. We're, we're getting a hold here from the RBNZ, maintaining that benchmark interest rate at 5.5%. This was basically no surprise seen by all economists that we surveyed as well. We're waiting for some more lines coming through in this statement here. Yeah, here we go. The economy has evolved broadly as anticipated. That doesn't really give us incremental information. Evolved in some, in what way? Um, initial Price action suggests, well, slightly lower, slightly weaker uh, on the Kiwi dollar, as Yvonne is pointing out. It will take us some time to get through uh, the statement and note any sort of changes. Restrictive policy stance remains necessary. Okay? okay, that's the initial line coming through. So that does strike a fairly more hawkish tone, but again, in the early goings. Anything else you've seen so far? Nothing else so far, yeah? Not so much uh, here this morning, mm. but we're watching very closely what goes on with the Kiwi dollar unchanged at the moment, which mm. is interesting as well. Um, let's bring in our Asia economics correspondent, Katia Dmitrieva. Uh, you know, based on this, it, it seems like they're still leaning a little bit more hawkish and pushing back on, on the prospect of even rate cuts here right mm. now. Do you think that's, that's justified? It's a great question. <laughs> I think everyone's asking that right now. It's, it's an interesting uh, move to make, especially when you've just entered uh, a double-dip recession mm. there in New Zealand. So typically you would expect with policy to come in and try to stimulate the economy and perhaps even start walking back some of those, uh, some of those conversations, some of those views, those hawkish views. But um, if they're keeping things elevated, you know, I think more than anything, it really highlights how pernicious inflation has been, not just in New Zealand, but I think globally. You know, it's the same story uh, with the FOMC. It's the same story in central banks globally, where you have um, maybe an economy not in a double dip recession like New Zealand, but you have economic conditions that are starting to weaken a bit. Um, and then you still have rates that have not only been at these uh, generation highs, but they're staying there. And uh, I think what New Zealand shows is that. You know, I think their inflation rate is something like 4.7 right now. Mm. 
way above the one to three percent band that they're looking for as as sustainable, and yet they're still holding rates at this level. So I think I think it really shows just um, how how dangerous this this um, inflation, if you want to call it a menace, uh, is in New Zealand, but also in other countries as well. Uh, for the line coming through here, uh, that they're keeping their cash rate restrictive as CPI returns to target, to your point, still above target on that. The, the, you know, one interesting line coming through as well here is that most central banks, according to the RBNZ, have been cautious about easy, easy monetary policy. And, you know, that takes me back to you, Katja, in terms of all of them are, you mentioned, they're all in the same boat. They're all mm -hmm. waiting for something to tell them what to do. Yes, and I think they're waiting for uh, the Fed. <laughs> yeah. no, I was going to go there, but yeah, okay. <laughs> you brought it up. Okay. I mean, the Fed is, is a big one, um, but also I think labor markets. Um, and in the case of New Zealand, uh, not only is there the housing market that's keeping things quite elevated, but they have this surge of immigration that they're saying is also threatening to keep things elevated for much longer. Um, in the U.S., it's very much a labor market story. I mean, we've had several months now where job growth has gone above 200,000, has gone past economist estimates, um, and inflation there, you can see, uh, well, we'll see this week, I guess, yes. but um, that's also been um, lingering. Can, can we talk about this U.S. inflation print, how important it is? I mean, inflation has been higher than what the Fed wants for some time now. We talk about whether it's just a blip or, or, or now an alarming trend. Will we see any relief later on today? I think the answer from economists, if you'll ask them, is no. Uh, hopefully, I mean, everyone can hope, but the part of the problem is that rents have remained elevated. We have these sort of faster moving indicators like the Zillow uh, home price index that's showing that things are still elevated. And rent, I think, has been kind of this um, pernicious, uh, it, it's been higher for longer than than analysts thought. So we're kind of uh, in a waiting game for that. Um, also, food prices have remained quite high. Um, so overall, I think analysts are expecting, you know, either um, a bit of a, on the headline, we might get some relief. Uh, core, maybe not so much. And year on year, it's actually expected to be elevated as well. Katia, thank you. Katia Dmitrieva, our Asia economics correspondent. Let's bring in Mark Kona now, our guest for this hour, CIO at AIA Group. Um, it, it seems like there's this long going debate about whether the Fed can deliver on three cuts this year. What do you make of this right now? Are we likely to see any? Well, it's not that long ago I was in the studio and the market was talking about six rate cuts yes. in the year. I think the, the market um, over uh, interpreted the Fed pivot in the uh, end of last year. Um, the Fed are keen to cut rates at some point to make a statement and build some insurance into the policy set. But they'll always be guided by the data and the data so far is not indicating the need to really cut rates. Yeah. We've still got, as you just discussed, we've still got um, inflation trends that are, that are causing concern. Um, it's proving stickier than, than perhaps the market had anticipated. You've got a tight job market, you've got an economy which is growing well, um, and you've got very, very strong uh, fiscal tailwinds. Um, which are really supporting the biggest economy in the world. At the same time, you've still got recovery, you know, you have early signs of recovery in China, recovery in Japan, early signs of recovery in Europe. So all of these, all of these items point to the fact that there is concern that inflation may hang around for longer than was originally anticipated. It might also point to just maybe the strongest signal yet that is, is it time to add further risk to portfolios? At well, the so, so there, are, there are risks associated with economies running too hot, mm. but in the short term, great news for equities mm. because you know, the, the earnings will continue to come through, investors will be invigorated by the economic uh, activity, uh, and we'll still see markets um, respond to that, and we'll still see positive momentum. Even in this region, in China, in China since what, early February, we've seen 10% put on um, Right. Depending on which index you're looking, which particular aspect of the market you're looking, um, you're still seeing you know, some good performance now, and hopefully that will encourage investors to, to come back into the markets. So you could say, basically, you can continue on, go long risk assets, equities, just, even if the Fed doesn't cut this year, do you think we could still see a, a decent rally across I, global I, equities? I, I strongly suspect that the Fed will cut this year. Okay. I think it will be later rather than sooner, so that expectation of two cuts first one in June is 
probably still needs to be adjusted. Okay. So there will be a rate cut. Um, that's a statement that needs to be made uh, you know, according to what has already been stated. Um, but can equities perform in that environment? Yes, they can. A, a, a little bit more um, elevated inflation in, in this current environment where growth is still strong, yeah. um, you know, employment is looking good. Why not? Which equity market seems most favorable at this point in time? Let me dig deeper into that. So we're, just, we're seeing probably the next stage or the next phase in the cycle is to see a broadening out of uh, the key markets. And, okay. and, and many are still very focused on the U.S. You know, you've got a, a very significant uh, public uh, uh, program which is encouraging a lot of uh, investment in infrastructure and technology. It's bringing in global capital, it's bringing in firms that want to onshore in the US to take advantage uh, of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. So that, that is clearly a very strong tailwind. Um, and the broadening out of the market is what we expect beyond that so-called Magnificent Seven. And then as we look out into this region, Taiwan and Korea are obviously doing well from the enthusiasm around AI. And as, as we get into the second half of the year, uh, we'll see a broadening out across this region with the Philippines probably being our most favoured market. Mm. Um, um, where we're seeing economic activity supportive of that and also Malaysia as we see the electronics industry more generally outside of a direct play on AI start to benefit from some of these some of these uh, factors is it is it more rotation into those laggards if well, you until, or is it yeah. tide rise I think until we see the rate cut and still we until we see some some clear policy direction um, it is a little bit of rotation mm -hmm. but um, I think as we go forward when we see a bottoming out of expectations and we're starting to see that even in China we're starting to see uh, a bottoming out of, of earnings expectations mm -hmm. depending on the sector in, in, in internet plays in manufacturing uh, we'll start to see more capital allocated but it's all about relativity as well of course as long as investors can make good money in the US there's there's a lack of appetite to move broadly outside of that okay and you mentioned about earnings revisions in China bottoming out is that a sign to start increasing exposure to China yet? so we've closed our underweight okay uh, that's the first step I think we're gonna we're gonna need to see more convincing evidence that the slight improvement that we've seen, the so-called green shoots of a recovery, uh, are, start to take hold and we build some momentum. Um, the big issue in China, of course, is consumer confidence, which has been massively depleted, and it's going to take a big effort to, to, to move that back to where, what we've seen pre-pandemic. Mark, there's a lot to unpack with, with, with China, so stay with us, of course. Sure. Uh, more with Mark Conan, of course, he'll be rejoining us uh, in a couple of minutes here. Very, very quickly, we're about 40 minutes into the cash market session. CSI 300 looking like this. Uh, just keep in mind, in case you missed it, we are coming off four days. So at this point, we are still on track for five days of weakness across this equity market. Uh, Asia, excluding what's happening in China, excluding, I should also note, Many, many markets that are shut today in the region are effectively flat ahead uh, of the U.S. inflation print. One sector we're tracking also very closely, auto stocks. So you had a big move on Xpeng and NIO overnight. You had some car uh, data numbers coming out of the PCA, that's a passenger car association in China, uh, talking about, you know, to, to Mark's earlier point, uh, some green shoots starting to emerge in EVs, for example, and generally cars, for example, we've seen a pickup uh, year and year and month and month in the month of March. We're up substantially across some of these names, and as promised, the broader read uh, across these markets as we approach that CPI prints later today and right after that RBNZ. We have one more rate decision, by the way in the region. Thailand. Bank of Thailand. There we go. Okay, equity markets looking like this. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Right, welcome back to shows. Mark Conan is still with us, CIO, AIA Group. Mark, one thing that's been causing a lot of heads to be scratched. <laughs> Is this 25% rally in gold prices? Yes. What's what? What's your theory? Well, it seems to have been born in in our part of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I think since um, the BOJ announced the end of YCC, mm -hmm. um, we've seen the gold ETF there take off. So I think it's a it's a retail play that's mm -hmm. built momentum. Uh, the prospect of, in real terms at least, if if the BOJ um, if the MO, uh, BOJ sorry BOJ hits its inflation targets, the the average you know savings 
pool that's invested uh, in bank deposits and, and, and low-risk assets, the prospect of that losing value in real terms is causing concern and we're seeing flow out into uh, other alternatives, gold being a key part of that. And we've seen that spill over into China, of course, where you know, there's reluctance and confidence depleted in terms of really embracing an, a, a, a rally in equity markets. We've seen a weaker currency. We've seen uh, interest rates, deposit rates fall. So a move into gold makes perfect sense. So we've seen it there. And we also see, of course, always uh, in India as well. So if you take those, those three components together, and then on top of that, there's a movement from central banks looking to hedge yeah. out some of potentially some inflation risk. Mm. That's what really driving. And it's going to be self-fulfilling because these rallies can, can run. So that's the reason. I'm curious, what, what, what role does gold play for someone, for a buyer like yourself, for example? Does uh, that it, have a role in your It doesn't. It's a non-yielding asset for okay. us. And, of yeah. course, we're liability-driven. We're backing long-term, long-dated liabilities that come to us from our policyholders. Mm. So we're really looking to match out cash flows. So predominantly we're fixed income, but we increasingly are looking to take advantage of where there are opportunities with risk, risk assets as well. But gold doesn't feature in that. Uh, <laughs> fixed income, though. It is interesting. Um, there's a lot of short interest in, in treasuries here right now. Um, there's also calls of, of maybe time to extend duration. Is, is this the right time to be doing that, Mark Conan? Well, if you've got concerns about inflation, probably not. Yeah. You know, so you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna get hammered at the, at the long end. And um, we need to see a steepening of the yield curve um, at some point. Uh, the first signal for that in terms of the next phase of the market cycle is, gonna, is going to be uh, when rates start to be cut. But for us, of course, we're matching out cash flow so we need that long duration exposure regardless um, because that's 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 what we're paid to do right what about credit how does that feature into well spreads are really really tight in, in, in high quality credit yeah. um, but it hasn't deterred investors because that prospect of rate cuts means that investors are keen to lock in yield wherever they can. So we saw an extraordinary January and February uh, in new issuance in the U.S., record levels of new issuance. Corporates took the opportunity to, to, to extend themselves and make sure they're managing out their, their debt requirements. And the market had a huge appetite for it on the prospect of rates being cut. Now, of course, that's going to moderate now yeah. as we're starting to see commentary around whether or not rates will be cut. As we've just discussed, we saw Jamie Dimon come out and say, well, they're, you know, they're more symmetric about which way rates will go. Right. You know, he's not, put, not putting his chips down on one side or the other. Yeah. Unusually um, so. Unusually so for him, yes, <laughs> yeah. indeed. And uh, so, 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 so perhaps the market won't be as buoyant, but of course you've got the Fed cutting it, the size of its balance sheet, but you've got a strong, as we've discussed, tailwind of, of fiscal support, which is driving, driving the economy. And the corporate sector in the U.S. is looking in very good shape. Um, obviously, you're talking about credit in the public markets. What about private markets So, right So now? we've seen, there's a lot of discussion around this and I think it's a permanent feature now of, of capital structure. We've seen banks pull back from, from many of the direct lending because of the cost that it brings to their, to their balance sheet and a lot of that has been, has been disintermediated, pushed out uh, into, into private credit um, and there are very large operators now in that, in that space. We're, we're active there. We see opportunities to pick up a yield in the short term um, and the credit, uh, the credit rating and the credit quality uh, is good at this point in the cycle. Do we need to worry about, because everyone's coming in here, everyone's starting a fund, everyone's yeah. getting together, do we need to worry about just competency? I don't know if that's a... Uh, well, it's like a, a stupid question. Yeah, because, you know. No, it's a great question, David. And we, we put a lot of effort into our due diligence in, yeah. in who we work with. Yeah. Long track records, stable teams. Mm. Um, long track record. Companies that have been at it a long time. Uh, th these are critical. You, it's not something that you can, you can pick up you know, on the fly. You need to have a lot of experience. We're in uh, unique circumstances, of course, compared to where we've been over the last 20 plus years. So having a long term perspective of where rates can go and now inflation impacts uh, economic activity and what the yeah. Fed are likely to do. These all come into play. I think you were talking to Hill House during Milken about yeah, two weeks the ago. disparity between the West and, and, and the East when it comes to the private credit space, where the U.S. market is quite mature. But here in Asia, there's still much more opportunity. No, nothing compares to, to the U.S. structure. Okay. The, the, the U.S. is a deep market with a strong backbone of, of demand coming yeah. out of private equity uh, and private finance and privately owned companies uh, and the need to be able to tap into sources of, of funding. Um, nothing like that exists in, in this part of the world. And, and as you look forward, this is what's needed in the biggest economy 
here in China. Yeah. But we're a long way away from that level of, of liberalization. Mm. Right. And, and so you mentioned that this might be a permanent feature. Structurally, give it to us if you could in percentage yeah. points. How, you know, a global portfolio, what is now appropriate public and private markets? If the benchmark, say, was, I don't know, was it 20% in alternatives, for example, or even less so? What well, does probably less. It depends like? who, 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 who it which, is. Which, which asset owner you're looking at. Right. But, but you, you see talk of, you know, somewhere around 15 to 20%. Uh, in private assets for a, t for a typical asset owner. Mm -hmm. um, so they're the sort of numbers we're talking about. Split across whether it's private equity, private credit, real estate uh, in fund format. So, so it's, a significant, it's a significant asset class. It operates differently to the public markets, of course. It's opaque, less transparent, um, and needs you know, really specialized um, capability to be able to deliver sequentially uh, uh, c across and through cycles. Mark, it's great to have you and back. Great to see Mark you. Coden, CIO Thank you. at AIA Group, joining us here in Hong Kong. If you are a subscriber, of course, you can catch up on all our interviews by using our interactive function TV Go. You can join the conversation, send us instant messages to our team and our guests. If you have a question for Mark Coden later, later on next time when he comes yeah. on, make sure to send us a message. Check yeah. it out yeah. at TV Go. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Magic number 17,000. <laughs> Who would have thought three years back that would be a good thing we're above that level right now, but such has been the delta in the narrative in this Hong Kong market. We'll take that in any form and shape it comes. 1.3% Hang Seng Index. We're down to a fifth day on short. Yep, and we certainly have, so we've got through the, the RBNZ, a hold there. The Bank of Thailand, I mean, this is the one that's, that's potentially could be quite interesting, right? Because the drama I mean, there. how long has this rift been going on between the government, the prime minister, and the central bank now? And it seems like now it's not just a political sort of maneuver if they do cut. I mean, mm. the economy is slowing down in some ways. Yeah, I, I can't remember whether it was the more, most recent conversation we had with the Bank of Thailand or the one before that. Uh, but it, it was for, for economic policymakers. The economic case was it was simply a matter, I think, of time. They were simply waiting for the data to really justify. And I think we were also waiting for the digital wallet scheme that was supposed to take up some of the growth slack, which I believe is not coming anymore yeah. this year. So it strengthens the case for a cut to come at some point, And you do have a small percentage small of economists group. that think that might come today. Seven out of the 17. Mm. Um, it, it's interesting. I think PMI has been in contraction. We were just talking to Mark Cronin about why he's still pretty underweight on Thailand because, yeah. you know, they haven't seen the tourist numbers come back mm. post-pandemic in a big way. 60% of pre-pandemic, I think, is yeah. spent. Yeah. So, you know, the, the fundamentals don't look that strong mm. right now to justify maybe that higher for longer scenario that many central banks seem to still want to hold mm. because they're waiting for the Fed. The question is, no one has, I guess, the nerve to preempt the Fed right now. Yeah, uh, especially because we don't know when that first cut comes, right? And, you know, you could, you, you could simply be buying... And, it, you, know, it's, you know, this is a point that was actually brought up. I forget wh whether it was on LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, because the conversation around do, do other central banks, can other central banks, do they have the room to reduce rates and, and wait for the Fed to cut interest rates? And... You know, the Bank of Japan is a good example of this. Yeah. It's actually very expensive to intervene and stabilize a currency. It's not like they can, that's a free lunch. Yeah. In any case, of course, in Thailand's case, there we go, the bot has decoupled. And of course, you were pointing out that there is also no inflation. So I think it's headline inflation or is it core, uh, which has been negative for about six months now in Thailand. So the case is increasingly there for a cut. Yeah. Um, the last decision, it was five to two split vote. So we're watching very closely how the voting turns out 
and if we see any sort of maybe is there a starting point from central bankers to even start talking yeah. about cuts here as well. You take a look when it comes to these markets. We talked about how, you know, there's still some quite a bit of a price action across these markets here, despite that we're holding uh, for that CPI print as well. Take a look at these Chinese turbine stocks, turbine maker stocks. Mm -hmm. So there's this probe that's going on in the EU when it comes to wind powers. So that's why you're seeing a bit of downside here uh, with the likes of Jiangsu, Sinojit, wind energy down some 3.5%. Machinery stocks are very much in focus as well. We talked about, obviously, there's this kind of industrial equipment upgrade that China yeah. has been trying to talk about as well. So we're seeing a jump. Look, some, some even limit up in China. Wuxi, Hangzhou, heavy machinery up 10% right now. Okay, yeah. So a lot of, um, that, well, at least this sector to borrow upon is powering up and the other one seeing some headwinds right now. And yeah, so we'll leave this here for now. Markets, apart from Hong Kong, are effectively flat or shut really across the region. Uh, we'll have plenty more heads. Uh, we're about an hour into the session here. This is Bloomberg. It's a slow day. 11.29 a.m. in Tokyo. Japanese markets are heading into that lunch break, of course. But uh, there's a lot going on with Japan. But overall, in the U.S. side of things, where the, the, the prime minister is there, set to meet that, uh, that bilat with Biden later on today. And then on Thursday, it's that trilat with Biden, Marcos, as well as with Kushida. Uh, we're hearing some lines from Ueda as well, saying not aiming for rigid 2% inflation target, which we'll see how the market interprets that. We're not seeing a whole lot of movement when it comes to dollar yen. We're still hovering around that 151, 152 level. Um, and the topics is slightly on the back foot here today. Not a whole lot of movement when it comes to JGBs as well. But, of course, we talked about that U.S. inflation print could be a trigger, the big catalyst for dollar yen. Yeah, everything's, everyone's waiting for that. And, of course, on top of that, you have this whole list of markets that are open. As you look at uh, a snapshot of the region, excluding those markets. So just to give you a sense, South Korea, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka are shut today. Missing out on this well, volume-less uh, pickup we're seeing across price as well. Now, uh, it's uh, time to check in on some of these forecasts as it pertains to the gaming sector in China out of Bloomberg Intelligence and, of course, certainly the, uh, this, this modest, they're seeing a modest boost to NetEase earnings. It's, if it revives, of course, this partnership, and it did, of course, revive that partnership with Microsoft-owned Activision. That news came out 90 minutes back. Uh, and, of course, the growth in also Tencent's video game unit looks set to normalize, although some risks remain. To lay that all out, perhaps in better form than I just stumbled on these scripts, Robert Lee is with us here, our senior analyst. Um, let's talk about the, the, what the outlook is for the gaming sector this year. Let's start very, very basic on that. Okay. Um, so within the domestic uh, game sector you know, within China, mm. uh, growth will normalize because mm. um, obviously the economy reopened last year, gave a short-term boost to the market. The market grew just below 14% year over year in 2022. So going into a more normal year and a slowing economic environment, then growth will likely slow to around 6%, which in terms of headline growth is quite a significant slowdown. But I think that that lower figure reflects the you know, maturity of the market and a degree of high saturation in the market. Mm. I guess all the potential gamers in China already there. I think there's 800 million or so of them. So it's, you know, it's a well, very well mature market, well, well developed mature market, and as a consequence, growth will slow. I think one brief additional point, um, the market is increasingly reliant on franchise titles. There's been a um, lack of new smash hits coming on. So particularly companies like Tencent and others are reliant on perhaps the hits of the past, which they mm. you know, put a lot of effort into reinvigorate and, and, and come up with new releases, etc. But also I think that is also tying into the slower growth outlook we're seeing within the China games market. Yeah, I mean... It's, it's hard to see if they could still continue to monetize on some of these old names. But for Tencent, what do you expect in terms of domestic gaming sales? Are they at risk of, of disappointing again? Yes. Uh, only sort of two, two, three weeks ago, we saw the disappointment on the uh, Q4 numbers. I think that is a residual risk, but market expectations have been brought down. So looking on, on our own uh, calculations and estimates, we're only looking for a few percentage growth within their domestic business. And I would say, you know, arguably the risk is potentially to the upside, depending on the success of their forthcoming titles. So, for example, DNF, which is a sort of dungeon fighter game, if that 
you know, does go down well in the market, then there is potentially a little bit of upside. But the, the, the core view on uh, Tencent is it's the growth within their ads business and their fintech business, which are more than half their sales, which are driving margin expansion and driving overall growth. It's not games. So the, the residual risks in games are contained to some degree. Uh, contained is one where you could describe this this relationship between NetEase and, and Blizzard Entertainment. They've continued on and collaborating. Uh, what do you make of this sort of announcement today? It is. It's sort of one of these things that has been a bit speculated in the market in recent months. Is you know, is it on? Is it off? Because the partnership broke apart at the end of last year. So the fact it seems to be um, back on again is definitely an incremental positive for NetEase. The read across across the wider sector is fairly limited. Um, but uh, I, th I think probably the most noteworthy thing of the uh, news is that this will potentially allow NetEase to port some of its mobile games onto Microsoft's uh, Xbox, so that could open up new market opportunities for them. But having said that, looking at market forecasts, I think consensus is looking for around 4% EPS growth for NetEase this year. That will probably be bumped up a little bit, but the growth that NetEase should deliver this year will not be matching the 44% growth that they delivered last year. So the business will still slow down markedly based on, you know, a really stellar year they they had in 2023. Yep, but those World of Warcraft fans are going to love this, right? Returning oh, to yeah. China um, on this news as well. Robert Lee, thank you, our senior analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. All right, some other big corporate stories that we're tracking for you today. Intel will roll out a new version of its AI chip in the third quarter in a bid to compete with NVIDIA. The Gaudi 3 processor focuses on helping to train AI systems and running the finished software. CEO Pat Gelsinger says the chip will cost less than NVIDIA's current and future processors. Boeing shares fell to the lowest in five months after an employee said the plane maker took shortcuts to ease production bottlenecks for the 787 Dreamliner. The engineer who worked on the plane says the alleged issues could dramatically reduce the life of more than a thousand for the jets in service. Meanwhile, Boeing handed over 83 jets for the first quarter, logging its lowest deliveries for the period since mid-2021. The majority of those planes were 737 MAX jets. And Meta is downplaying the threat of AI disinformation in a big election year at an event on Tuesday. Its top leaders say they have not seen that happen yet on their services. Now, last week, Meta announced plans to label all AI-generated content on Facebook and its other properties. Experts fear, though, such media could mislead voters or spread disinformation online. Now, just ahead, South Koreans are voting for a new parliament in what's effectively a referendum on the president and their performance. A live update from Seoul. Just ahead, this is Bloomberg. So about 37 minutes back, the RBNZ, as expected by all economists, kept rates unchanged at 5.5%. And based on what's come out so far, have well, the bank has struck a, a generally more hawkish tone, really, that they do need to see policy remain restrictive for a sustained period of time and that they're cautious, along with other central banks, of cutting, acknowledging this patience scenario that most central banks right now are in, cautious about easing monetary policy, Kiwi dollar stronger, as you can see on that news. Now, um, let's get more on this uh, This big meeting that's taking place, of course, over in Washington. You have the Japanese Prime Minister there, Fumi Kishida, the agenda uh, at the U.S. Capitol, his first state visit, in fact, the first state visit by a Japanese leader in almost a decade. Uh, U.S. Ambassador to Japan, Ram uh, Emanuel, spoke to us earlier from the White House lawn saying that he has high expectations of this meeting. This comes at a historic moment for both countries as they change dramatically their kind of deterrent uh, posture and position. Japan's changed in the last two years five separate policies that have been basically on the books for 70 years from the size of the defense budget, the counter strike capability in the defense area, normalizing and level, really bringing the level of relationship with the ROK, the Republic of Korea, to a new, more solid strategic level. The United States also has made some fundamental changes going from a hub and spoke system to a lattice uh, multinational type of strategic architecture. And I kind of see this state visit 
the fourth from a uh, head of state in the region out of five that the president's done. It's kind of putting a period at the end of one era that's defined as alliance protection and beginning to write the first chapter of the new era of alliance projection with uh, the, Japan. And that's not just for the Indo-Pacific, but also as a key strategic partner in a global set of issues. The second thing, it's kind of a uh, bookend. The week started with Australia, the United States, Japan, and the Philippines doing naval and uh, air exercises together in a new multinational uh, effort, and have the end of uh, the week with a historic first ever trilateral between the United States, Japan, and the Philippines head of state. That reflects and symbolizes the change in the United States approach. It also symbolizes the uh, kind of role that Japan's going to play as a constant in our era, in our relationships in the area. But it also symbolizes China's whole strategy is to isolate the Philippines, isolate Australia with their economic origin, isolate Japan by not accepting uh, their fish to be exported. Our strategy is to flip that script and make the isolated party China. They're the ones that are uh, isolated in the South China Sea as it relates to the Philippines. They're the ones that are isolated when it comes to trying to uh, use economic coercion to coerce Australia to change their posture. And they become the isolated party, which is why they throw in the towel on that effort. So that's how this uh, state visit. It's been a long, it's been uh, nine years since the last Japanese pre uh, prime minister has had a visit, but it comes at a critical juncture where the relationship will pivot into a new kind of posture and a new position. I wanted to hone in, Ambassador. You've mentioned, of course, the first trilat summit with the Philippines. How far do you expect Japan to involve itself when it comes to these confrontations in the South China Sea, where, of course, these encounters tend to be more aggressive than what we see in the East China Sea? Well, the whole goal is not to have a conflict. That's what credible deterrence is. And understanding that this is not China versus the Philippines. This is China trying to uh, coerce the Philippines into changing their policy, on which the international court in 2016 ruled was in favor of the Philippines, not China. And understanding that China needs to understand that the Philippines has some very, very important friends in the neighborhood, the United States, Japan, and Australia in this situation. That was the U.S. Ambassador to Japan, Rahm Emanuel, speaking to our colleague Heidi Strahl Watts earlier. Meanwhile, we've got to talk about this deal. Nippon Steel's $14 billion takeover bid for U.S. Steel had been widely viewed as a slam dunk, but... In a historic intervention, the biggest U.S. steel union has decided to do everything in its power to block the deal and winning the backing of President Biden. For more on today's Big Tate, let's bring in our commodities reporter, Martin Ritchie. Martin, why has this deal become so complicated? Uh, yeah, it's a $14 billion firestorm, I think is what our Big Take article called it today. Look, this should have been uh, or could have been a fairly straightforward transaction. It's a big, uh, advanced, well-known uh, Japanese company buying uh, steel plants in the U.S., uh, Japan and the U.S., as we've just heard from uh, the U.S. ambassador to Japan, very strong allies. Um, but this transaction has ended up not just with... Uh, uh, the unions uh, bulking, um, but Biden, President Biden, also saying, um, you know, this mill, should, this, this company, this iconic American industrial company, should stay U.S. owned. It's all about politics. Uh, obviously, a very complicated political year uh, in the U.S. Um, and some of U.S. Steel's operations, some of its key operations, and the ones that are seen perhaps most at risk are in Pennsylvania, uh, a swing state. Um, so. Biden really wants those union votes. Uh, when the unions uh, come out fighting against this deal because they're worried about what might happen uh, under new ownership, um, Biden's looked to back them, uh, and that's thrown it into sort of disarray. Um, added to that, there's also a US company, Cleveland Cliffs, which has uh, mulled making a rival bid, uh, union-backed bid, uh, to keep the company US-owned. Well, okay, can, can the deal st still happen here? Uh, look, um, when I first heard about uh, what Biden said, uh, I think he said uh, this company must remain U.S. owned. Uh, obviously, uh, 
that's a, that's a pretty big thing for an American president to say about a transaction. And when I first heard that, I really thought, well, this, this is just dead, this, this deal is not going to happen. Um, but it does seem from the report, reporting I've heard coming out of the US uh, that people do think there is possible path forward, perhaps uh, after the election, uh, especially if Biden is, is, is re-elected. Um, but I don't think that the politicians uh, really want to rock the boat uh, during an, an election year. Um, we've seen the sort of Democratic senator, um, John Fetterman, who's quite well known in, in Pennsylvania, um, you know, come out strongly against the deal as well. Um, it's very important for uh, the Democrats to, to get Pennsylvania. And in that context, um, uh, they're going to try and do, do their best to uh, kick it along the road, I think. And it's interesting. I mean, that's that's what's happening domestically in the U.S. But if you take a look at the geopolitical implications with this, I mean, Biden is basically meddling in a deal that involves not China or Russia. But we're talking about a close ally here, Japan, Martin. So is this a problem for Japan-U.S. relations? And do you think it's going to be discussed this week in this trilat? Uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, it's a deal that... Um uh, has ended up with the National Security Review Board. Don't know if I got the exact uh, title there right, but you know it's 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 been referred to the government organisation, which typically reviews transactions involving involving, say, Russia or or, or China, um, which is unusual, um, I think, for for a Japanese company. But um, and it is a sort of elephant in the room, I guess, uh, for the the talks between Kishida and and Biden in Washington. But then again, it is a relatively a relatively small matter, and I think from the Japanese perspective, they likely understand that this is a very complex political year for Biden, and they understand why um, he's had to sort of respect and go along with what the unions um, are, are looking for. So um, it, it might come up in talks. I'm not sure, but I, I don't think it's enough to you know, derail the relationship, which obviously has a lot of other complicated aspects, not not least dealing with the, uh, the rise of China. Okay, Martin. Thank you so much, Martin Rich, here, commodities reporter in Shanghai for us. You can read all. The, well, you can read the full story uh, on today's big take on the terminal, or also by heading to Bloomberg.com. Now, speaking of heading somewhere, South Koreans are headed to the polls here, voting for a new parliament in what's effectively a referendum on President uh, Yoon suk yeols performance. Now, the results will determine really how much power uh, the president has during the remainder of his three years uh, in office. Let's bring in John Herskovitz, our East Asia government editor, with us out of Seoul. John, for foreign investors, why do we need to care about this? Well, if Yoon's uh, People Power Party can get control of Parliament, it means for the final three years in office, he can implement some uh, pro-business reforms, some market reforms. Um, cut. Uh, he's looking at cuts on real estate, on uh, businesses, trying to advance an agenda that is probably investor-friendly and business-friendly. And um, this is the, the one vote for parliament while he's in office. It's a single five-year term in South Korea. After the vote, he'll have three years remaining. And this will determine if he's in a more powerful position or in a weaker position for the, remaining of, for the remainder of his three years in office. So what are we watching out for? What are some of the key numbers that we need to, to really pay attention to? Yeah, the vote is for all seats in the 300-seat parliament, known as the National Assembly. The big number is 150, 151 for the majority. If uh, the Democratic Party, the opposition, has the majority now, if it uh, builds on its numbers and gets to 180, it can block things like filibusters. If it gets as far as 200, it has the power to override vetoes and even implement impeachment procedures, which could hobble and even possibly uh, end the Yoon government. Okay, well, what are, the, what are the key items that people are thinking about what determines these votes? What is on, the, what, what, what dominates mind space of voters at this point, John? Is it, 
Is the big issue is really the pocketbook issues. Mm -hmm. Pocketbook issues. Inflation is uh, eating into paychecks. People have seen rises in prices for um, basic foodstuffs, fruits, vegetables. Um, housing prices have been on a tear for several years. And also, it's just getting basic strength for the uh, export-driven economy. So people are looking at their finances and they're voting with uh, the direction that their wallets may take them. That's the key issue for the race. The, the bigger geopolitical stuff, the um, security issues, uh, policy with North Korea, it's not really a dominant part of the election. And that's actually expected to keep on track regardless of how the votes go today for parliament. John, thank you. John Herskovitz there, our East Asia government editor, joining us out of Seoul. I just want to track what's been going on with this rally underway in Hong Kong, and it seems to be getting quite a bit of momentum here in terms of the eight share market. Yes, we have now bounced back 20% from the lows that we saw back in the around January 22nd or so. Mm. Um, that's only been something that we've been watching for, I think, a few weeks now. We're finally reaching those levels if we actually close at that level as well. So that's only one to watch. HSI is also flirting around the highs of this year. So quite broad based. It's a good Wednesday. OK, we'll tell you about some of the movers that are pushing these benchmarks to current levels. Plenty more ahead, suffice to say. This is Bloomberg. Here's a look at your China brief, a look at stories making headlines in local Chinese papers and trending on social media today. Well, Xinhua News Agency is highlighting regulations covering the economy and when it comes to consumer rights, it says the government has published specific measures for industrial equipment upgrades to develop so-called, quote, new quality productive forces. That's why we're seeing some of these industrial equipment stocks really rallying here big time today. Meanwhile, the Internet regulator is banning businesses from collecting excessive per personal information when providing services through apps. The report cites an official who says companies should not force consumers to provide information irrelevant to their operations. Plus, the Securities Times echoing many economists and analysts and investors out there said it is important for macroeconomic policies to maintain their strength in the second quarter due to its, quote, practical significance. So something still people still want to hear to, I guess, justify the rally that we've seen this year, Dave. Yeah, I mean, real proof helps, doesn't it, sometimes? There Always, we go. right? Uh, and it's really an intention, I guess, you know, a signal of policy intention that we are looking for more um, things to latch on to, particularly when you look at where this market is, right? We just broke that headline earlier on Hang Seng China Index, already 20% up from those lows on January 2020. Well, Jan 2024, 22 of 2024. Okay, sorry, stumbling. <laughs> uh, auto stocks, um, really uh, more so on Yvonne's point earlier on, right? Uh, more proof coming through Passenger Car Association out with some very good industry numbers for March, a pickup in these. I uh, had a very big pickup, of course, as well in the U.S. session. Hang Seng Index, bottom of your screens. Uh, Kiwi assets, uh, we're looking at that uh, fairly unexpected uh, outcome out of the RBNZ, although quite a bit of a hawkish tone, needing more time uh, in terms of uh, just being needing policy restrictive for uh, a fair amount of time uh, as well. Now, we're going into the CPI report later today, and I think it, this gets lost in the noise. It may be a kind public service reminder that stocks have actually done very well, particularly in developed markets like the U.S. and Europe. So 20 out of the 23 weeks from November, we've seen gains. Europe's 19. China is about half the time. So it's been good, but uh, I guess good on a spectrum. Uh, it's a good way to put this. It's still very much the DMs that have outperformed yeah. still. Uh, at this pinpoint or point. You take a look when it comes to the rest of Asia, what we're dealing with here today. Of course, that U.S. CPI print is still front and center here in the next few hours or so. We're still seeing a decent rally, right? And in particular, I think a lot of it is the Hong Kong market that's yeah. driving these gains here right now. But in Hong Kong, every single sector is in the green on this Wednesday morning. That's it from us here from the China Show. Bloomberg Markets Asia is up next. Stay with us.